Hello, I'm Byzantnik and in this tutorial I'm going to show you some basics of E4 multiplayer combat. Now I will be simplifying and omitting a lot of stuff so you'll still have a lot of exploring the game to do yourself, but after watching this video you'll hopefully have a solid foundation for going forward. Let's start from the very beginning. When you open the military tab, the first thing from the top you see are the three different types of units. Infantry, Cavalry and Artillery. At the start of the game only the first two are available, with artillery coming in later. Infantry is the most important, vast majority of your troops will be infantry and they're going to be doing most of the killing and the dying in your name. Cavalry is far less popular and honestly you should just not recruit them. The reason is simple, cavalry costs 2.5 times more than infantry while not being 2.5 times more effective in battle, so it's better to just have more infantry. Of course, there are certain timings and situations in which cavalry can be beneficial, but explaining that would require its own advanced tutorial. The final unit, artillery, works a bit different in battle than the rest, which I will explain in a bit. Usually you'll want to keep a stack or two of artillery in your army, even though it's very expensive. Now, what exactly are units? When we click on a unit type name, we can see all present and future unit types, and all of them have a different set of pips. And basically, the more pips, the better. When you have a choice in a single tech, it's good to go for more morale pips, preferably defensive. It's important to note that different technology groups have different sets of units, and they might have different timings or peaks of strength. For example, at the very beginning, West Africa has the strongest units, and at the end, the Western units are the strongest. By looking at pips, you can see what I meant when I said that cavalry is less effective. On this deck, it only has 25% more pips while being 150% more expensive. When we look at artillery pips, we can see that it starts with not that many at all, so it's usually considered that it becomes worth its high cost at military tech 13. However, if you can afford it earlier, it's of course still useful, especially for sieges. Next, let's cover all the different modifiers that are shown in military screen. Combat ability, fire modifier, shock modifier, military tactics, discipline and morale all directly affect your unit's performance in battles. You gain military tactics, fire modifier and shock modifier mostly by simply advancing in military technology. To increase the remaining three, you need to collect all the bonuses you can get from ideas, missions, advisors, events, religion and so on. This is where you get a chance to gain an edge over your enemy in quality and while they do slightly different things, essentially you just want more of all of those. There is some discussion about morale being the most important because it allows you to stay longer in battles and then actually win them, which is what wins wars, but that's going beyond the basics. Anyway, having superior army quality makes wars much easier, so it's vital you grab as many as you can. Another modifier army tradition is gained by fighting in wars and from a variety of other stuff, either directly increasing it or reducing decay. Army tradition gives you more morale, which is great but more importantly it allows you to roll for better generals who are crucial in wars as you'll see. A lucky 6 shock general in the early game can easily turn the tide when outmatching the war. Next we have fort defense and siege ability which basically affect the time it takes to siege a fort. It's nice to have for sure but it's not very important. Cavalry to infantry ratio is largely irrelevant since you won't be in cavalry anyways. Force limit is actually part of your economy, not military, since it's only increasing the cost of your units when you're going over this limit. I'm ignoring all the naval modifiers since I'm not covering naval combat anyways. Finally, there's combat width, and honestly this right here is the most important part of the tutorial. It shows you how many units can fight in a single row on the battlefield and slowly increases with tech. That means that every time you engage an enemy, you always want to do it with at least one combat width of infantry, at least as long as you can afford it so that you are dealing maximum damage to your enemy. Now there are two rows for each side in the battle, and both infantry and cavalry only actually participate in the battle while fighting in the first row. Remember when I said artillery works a bit different than the rest? Artillery is the only one that deals damage well in the second row, and additionally increases defensive pips of the unit in front of it. Fun fact, artillery actually does more damage when the first row, however it also receives even more so it's not really worth it to put it there. So, when you start a battle, ideally you want to do it with one or two combat widths of infantry and a combat width of artillery. The obvious question is, why only this many? After early game, a lot of nations will be able to afford many more units, so why not just dump them all immediately in battle? That's because while only units on the two rows are fighting, all units in battle are taking morale damage. That means that if your enemy is slowly enforcing his initial stack, 
and you just put all your troops in at once, he will surely win the battle. So how do you reinforce? First of all, you only reinforce with infantry since artillery will continue to fight in the second row even when it reaches zero morale. How many infantry units and how often is a bit more difficult to say. As a rule of thumb, you should reinforce the battle with half the full combat width of infantry every about 10 days. When your enemy has superior quality, you should do it more often to compensate your higher losses. Also, the longer the battle goes, the faster reinforcement needs to be. Obviously, it's always better to reinforce too fast and lose some efficiency than to reinforce too late and lose the battle. So when in doubt, I would always go a bit faster. Finally, let's look at the pain of every EU4 player's existence, the battle dice roll and its modifiers. Basically, you roll a 0 to 9 die, apply modifiers and the result affects the damage your units deal. The higher roll you get, the better. Let's look at those modifiers. You can get them from two main factors, generals and terrain. For each point of fire or shock that your general is superior over your enemies, you gain plus 1 to dice roll. Since having your dice roll higher by just 1 translates roughly to having 8% more discipline, having a general that's superior by 5 or 6 points will mean you will be able to crush your enemies almost regardless of their quality or quantity. Unfortunately, in practice and advantage this big rarely happens, but it's extremely important to keep in mind. On the terrain, the way it works is the attacker will get a negative modifier depending on the promises terrain. 0 for flat, minus 1 for rough and minus 2 for mountains, and additional minus 1 for crossing a river or minus 2 for crossing a strait or landing on ships. To avoid this advantage in battle you can conveniently use the simplified terrain map mode, however if you get attacked while sieging a fort you will be considered an attacker and receive all the terrain maluses that come with it. Not to mention that all battles in a small way favor the defender. Sometimes it's impossible to avoid fighting on a mountain fort if you want to conquer your enemy, but this one is super important. Most wars won by an underdog happen because of their mountain forts, and you should always keep it in mind. One question you might have is that if a uh, minus 2 for mountains is such a big deal, what if I keep rolling zeros and my enemy keeps rolling 9s, would I be totally screwed? And the answer is yes, yes you will be screwed. Thank you for watching, I tried to keep things simple as possible, maybe too much honestly, but hopefully there was at least something new for you to learn, and well, see ya next time.